So at this point in our coverage of quantum mechanics, I think it's good to spell out and uh, enumerate what I'm going to be calling quantum assumptions. As I say in a few places, uh, quantum mechanics has traumatic beginning. So um, a lot of uh, the development of quantum mechanics kind of has this feel of someone trying to figure out the layout of the room in a completely dark setting just by feeling around. And um, the beginning of quantum mechanics begins with a, a bit of a few ad hoc assumptions. And what I want to highlight here are some key assumptions that turn out to be lasting, turn out to be incorporated into the uh, later, the fully built out uh, model of quantum mechanics. And um, the first of those assumptions are introduced by Max Planck. It was introduced as he was trying to um, develop what we call Planck law that explains the black body radiation spectrum. And uh, he introduced this assumption that the energy of an oscillator can have only discrete quantized values. Let me write it in a slightly different way, which goes a little bit better with uh, the format that Einstein used in his explanation of the photoelectric effect which is that um, there's this relationship between energy and frequency of oscillatory phenomena, that the, the quantized energy of an oscillatory phenomena is proportional to its frequency and uh, constant of proportionality, uh, letter H, which we call Planck's constant, um, it, uh, it's fundamental that it, there are uh, several different phenomena where it can, you can really only fully explain it by assuming a quantized uh, discrete amount of energy transferring, and this is the unit of that quantized energy. And Einstein extended this idea of Max Planck's to in um, to posit existence of photons, particle of light that he used to explain photoelectric effect. And, um, and I talked about how Einstein actually didn't go far enough. Um, the other key assumption that turns out to hold as we later introduce wave mechanics is um, De Broglie hypothesis. Uh, De Broglie's uh, supposition that this uh, relationship between or between uh, light wave and photon uh, might hold for uh, might hold for everything that has momentum. I'm going to write this in a slightly different way, which would be to relate a momentum of something like light or a particle that it's going to be related to its uh, wavelength by Planck's constant divided by wavelength. So this is the de Broglie hypothesis, and this uh, is a kind of a natural consequence of what uh, Einstein assumed about photon. And the kind of surprising thing is that this turns out to hold for everything. Um, and your textbook talks about wave particle duality. And yeah, it, it, and this expression uh, relates to both uh, what we typically associate with a particle property, that is momentum, with the wave property, that is wavelength. And I want to, in this <laughs> short lecture, I want to introduce us to one more quantum assumption that you are going to see later this week. And this is going to be going to turn out to be fundamentally important in uh, in many different areas. And I guess uh, um, at, in the context of this class, uh, you will see its role in chapter eight as we talk about the atomic uh, levels and all that, um, the place where it get, this assumption gets introduced 
is in the Bohr's semi-classical model of the hydrogen atom. So uh, let me scroll to the place where Bohr's assumption comes in. And, you know, when we talk about the Bohr model, um, we do say that it's not fully correct. There are some things that Bohr got wrong. But the one thing that will turn out to be correct uh, to a far greater extent than Bohr might even have guessed is this idea of quantization of angular momentum. So the idea that angular momentum comes in this quantized unit of h bar, reduced to Planck constant, where it's a shorthand that we use for h divided by 2 pi. It saves us a lot of writing by not having to write 2 pi every single time. The idea of quantization of angular momentum, it's going to hold for orbital angular momentum, which is what Bohr was considering in, a, in his model of a hydrogen atom. And it's going to hold for other kinds of angular momentum, like the spin angular momentum that you will see more of in chapter eight later on. So, um, so these are what I like to highlight as quantum assumptions, because as we introduce quantum mechanics in a semi-historical fashion, some of the things we introduce are not the things that will ultimately turn out to be fully correct like the Bohr's model, that's not the fully correct the model of the hydrogen atom as we understand it. But these assumptions um, are the things that, as it will turn out, we won't have to change any of these as you learn quantum mechanics better. We'll be able to retain these, fold these into our mathematics of quantum mechanics. So watch out for them as we continue our study in quantum mechanics and physics in general.